We now are ready for our second keynote of the day. And the uh, moderator, the introducer, will be Anne-Marie Maza. Anne-Marie was the director of that infamous report that we've been talking about today, and, and the report that is the reason for us all being here. And that was 10 years ago. And Anne-Marie is 10 years older, at least. <laughs> um, and so one of the things we'll be discussing in the very last session, or that I hope will be discussed, is what, what if the Academy were holding its, its meeting now to talk about this subject, what, what, if to do it again, uh, which I don't think Anne-Marie is eager to do, but what, what, would they, what kind of a grade would they uh, give the forensic community? But anyway, Anne-Marie will introduce our keynote. Thank you, Deborah. Um, indeed, I aged 10 years during that study. Um, and as my children say, Mom, you don't know what it did to us, too. Uh, so um, thank you very much. And I, on behalf of the National Academies, I want to thank AAAS, the Innocence Project, and NIST for inviting us to um, participate with you in organizing today's uh, meeting. As um, Deborah said, um, I did serve as study director on that um, activity. But at the Academy, it takes more, it takes a team to get a committee um, off and running. And so I do want to acknowledge two of my colleagues who are here today, uh, Dr. Scott Wademan and Dr. Stephen Kendall, who also participated in that study. The study was co-chaired by Judge Harry Edwards and um, Dr. Constantine Gastonis, and was comprised of members of the scientific community, the forensic science community, as well as the legal community. Um, indeed, one of the members of that committee, Joe Cecil, is here with us today, and he'll be speaking um, later. It was mentioned earlier today that one of the recommendations made, indeed it was the number one recommendation made of that report, was the creation of an independent body, the National Institute of Forensic Sciences, that would provide um, a local point for discussions about forensic science, for research about forensic science, um, and that this body would be independent and could carry out all the other 12 recommendations that were articulated in that report. Uh, the committee also recognized that is, if the Forensics Institute didn't get started immediately, um, that we could still begin work on all the other recommendations. I just want to highlight for you a few of the um, criteria that the committee specified for this independent entity. They said, number one, that it should be rooted in the culture of science, that it should have st strong ties to the state and local forensic communities, that it should not be wedded to the current system, but it should learn from the current system, and that it should not be part of any existing law enforcement entity. This afternoon, we have an opportunity to hear about a National Institute of Forensic Science in Australia and to learn how they structured themselves and how they're able to carry out their work. I should say that the recommendation for their institute was first called for in 1974, and it took, I think, until 1991 uh, for their institute uh, to be established, so I remain uh, hopeful. Uh, joining us today, I'm pleased to say, is Dr. Lindsay wilson Wild, who's the director of the Australian National Institute of Forensic Science. She has a PhD from, the uni from Canberra University in species identification, and she has over 20 years of experience in the forensic science field. She's been involved in a number of very high profile cases, including the 2002 Bali bombing institute, uh, incident. And you can read more about her in the program. So Dr. Wilson Waddle. I'm a little bit terrified about uh, making sure I can get onto this. Okay, done, great. Um, I'd like to thank the organizations hosting um, this uh, conference event for inviting me. Um, I'm hoping this presentation is going to be informative, uh, but a little bit challenging at the same time. And I thought I'd start with um, looking at the National Institute of Forensic Science, and the Australian New Zealand Forensic Landscape, just to put some context around the work that we're doing um, here. 
I'll start off by saying our National Institute of Forensic Science is not big. It contains six people, if you include me. Um, it does exist within a broader agency called the Australia New Zealand Policing Advisory Agency, and we were um, encompassed within that in uh, between 2008, a decision was made, and we eventually resided with them in 2010. Um, prior to that, we're a standalone agency, and I'll talk about the impact a little bit that that's had, uh, because it goes to the point made earlier. But You'll see, I'll talk about all of the work that we've done and the, the activities and the projects, and I just want to make it clear that we can do all of this with our agency of six because we have the buy-in from the forensic science community. We utilise discipline experts not only in the government service providers but also in academia, other government departments and other research institutes. And it's because of this buy-in to this concept of a NIFS um, and the built-up relationship that we've developed over over 25 years, over 27 years of existence, that makes it such a powerful entity. So that's really important, I think. We exist in a broader landscape. Um, we have quite a number, as I said before, of um, groups, uh, specialist advisory groups, and just out looking up. Nope. Ah. Nope. That's wrong. I'm just going to leave that. Um, special advisory groups that you can see down the bottom, and these cover things like biology, documents, um, chemical criminalistics, toxicology, etc. We run another, uh, a number of other groups as well. We engage with special interest groups such as the Australian New Zealand Forensic Science Society and the Australian Academy of Forensic Science. We li liaise with other government departments such as Defence. Um, the Australian Criminal Intelligence Commission, which is an entity that runs all of the police information systems. International networks such as this, as I said before, academia, standards bodies such as Standards Australia and accreditation bodies. And they're all um, integral to the work that we do. Now, as I said, we sit within a broader agency called ANSPA. ANSPA is a law enforcement agency, so their primary focus is on law enforcement issues. And they have a board, and the board is made up of the police commissioners of Australia and New Zealand. We, are across, uh, we operate across the two countries. Um, that's quite significant. They are a larger uh, senior government um, uh, leaders and our government, uh, governance body. Under that, then, we have the Australian New Zealand Forensic Executive Committee. We know forensics is broader than law enforcement. So our forensic service providers sit in health, in justice, in other science departments. And so we bring those together, together with the police representatives of the heads of the police forensic uh, service providers, together in what we call the Australian New Zealand Forensic Executive Committee. So this committee is the NIFS Primary Governance Committee. So this is the committee that actually comes together and uh, gives us our direction and our focus areas. So the way this works is, um, and, it's, and it's quite an elegant system, we have a strategic plan which sets out programs of work, and I'll talk about those programs of work in a minute. It is the police commissioners as the ANSBAR board that approve the programs of work and the funding. Um, and one of those programs might be research and innovation. But what research project we then do and what the priority is, um, is really probably not the technical remit of the commissioners. So that sits with ANSFEC. So ANSFEC are the body that says which, what our priorities are for workshops, for education training, for projects. So they're the one that do the detail uh, direction of our day-to-day -day projects and activities. Um, if, however, we have a project, because forensics and the implications of forensics and the applications of it runs broader than just the forensic service providers, so if we want to do a project that leaks out into those um, areas, we want, to, we want to create the connection between forensics and police, we can go to the board. For instance, we did a project on rapid DNA, and we wanted to look at if you put a rapid DNA device within a police station, what would be the cost benefit of it? What would, what's the bang for the buck of what you would get? But in order to put it in a police station, we need police support. So this model allows us to go to the police commissioners, seek approval for that, and then we can then implement that project across 
um, across the agencies. As soon as it's been approved by a police commissioner, then you get a contact name, it's a command and control, um, you get a police station, you get access to investigators and everything. So you can do an end-to-end -end, uh, project uh, within this process. Also, sitting in this environment, um, if we have an issue such as we would like to um, revise the DNA database and have a look at what the possibilities for extending the database are into the future, we can go to the ANSPAR board who can then send it over to the um, ACIC, the Australian Commission for in um, Criminal Intelligence, and um, they can then task that group to then have a look at the database. Similarly, if we're looking at new and emerging capabilities and we want to have a look at legislative implications or policies or how to handle those sorts of things, the police commissioners can, if they choose to do, uh, send issues to the police ministers or the attorney generals for discussion. So we can get traction in a broader area, uh, which means our impact can be bigger. So it allows us to have influence and impact, whereas a single agency, we would not get it. We wouldn't be able to. Um, so that's probably the biggest difference that I've seen from when NIFS was an independent agency from when it was incorporated within ANSBAR. It's that impact that can't be underestimated. So in terms of our areas, uh, we look at coordination, so coordinating national projects, innovation, uh, education training, quality and information management. And all of these areas are in the cross-jurisdictional space. So we don't go in and do an education training program for one lab. We would run a single workshop and bring all the labs in together um, to then collectively do that educa education training and then they take that information back out to the agencies. Um, or recently, I don't know about you, but we have an ageing firearms um, practitioner uh, base and our, our capability is in... Um, as of concern because we need to maintain the capability and we have a number of firearms um, examiners who are about to retire and a lot of trainees. So that is an issue for us cross-jurisdictionally around the country. So we ran a two-week high intensive workshop that trained every single trainee in the country in two of the modules that they need for their national training program. We have a national training program. Um, and so that that sort of drove forward the training, and we're going to do another one of those to again drive it forward to address this capability risk that we're currently wearing. So that's a sort of gives you a reflection of the type of work we do. Now, I thought I would start with um, the activities that we've been doing before the NAS report, um, because obviously our agency has been going for over 27 years, um, and so there's a lot of things that we're kind of doing that are sort of relevant. So one of the things we do is we coordinate proficiency testing on behalf of Australia and New Zealand. Um, a lot of the proficiency tests are purchased in from America or Europe, and so we get the import permits that are required, we coordinate it all, uh, we do the administration, and what this does is it gives us a collective buying power but it also encourages all the labs to participate in proficiency testing. And because we make it cheaper and we do the admin, then we make it more cost effective for them to participate. So we, in effect, um, assist them in participating in these things. And where there isn't a proficiency test, such as crime scene, we develop one. So we've developed uh, After the Fact, which is an online tool that we've been doing since 1996. Um, and we do uh, two scenarios every year. One is a major crime, the other one is a minor crime. Um, and doing this, we can actually have a look at um, uh, the performance of all the labs within the after the fact over the years. Um, we can have a look and see if there's any particular er errors or there's any particular issues. And if there are any, then we can develop up an education training tool and then implement it. So it kind of all ties together, as you'll, you'll see, I hope. Education training, as I've mentioned, um, we run an annual workshop training. Uh, we had six workshops last year. I'm horrified to say we have about 10 next year. I don't know how that happened. Um, but we do a, a lot of this. This is all around facilitating. We don't run it ourselves. We, we use that community that I spoke about before. We bring in the experts to do the training, and we just um, promote and, and facilitate it to occur. 
Um, there are also national training qualifications for forensic science for crime scene fingerprints and firearms. You'll hear me pick on those uh, three quite a lot um, because we've developed up quite an infrastructure around them. Um, so every trainer in the country is trained to the same qualification and the same guideline. Um, and then what we do is we run a certification program. So we also run this certification program that tests individual practitioner competency, and again, in crime scene fingerprints and firearms, and the numbers on the board. Um, and we've just um, been reinvigorating this uh, policy and this process. Um, it's been quite a, quite a journey, I've got to say. But essentially, um, the person needs to meet that national training qualification before they go in. They need some experience and they need their supervisor's support to say, yes, this person is ready. Um, so they nominate it, there's an approval process, then they go through an assessment process. So there's a written exam, a practical exam, and an oral exam that they need to go through. And we've been, we're actually rewriting, we've rewritten all of these at the moment. The written exams um, has a lot of contemporary issues uh, component to it. The practical exams are now all ground truth known. Um, so we can use that uh, data for other things as well, such as um, uh, looking at studies and error rates, et cetera. And the oral exam is a panel. They then do annual recertifications based on proficiency test performance. And then every five years, there's a recertification process that they now have to go through that's essentially similar to a lawyer system that's supported by um, CDP points. Um, and they need to demonstrate that they have maintained their competency and kept up with contemporary issues in that whole process. Um, it's all available on the website. Another thing we've worked in uh, for a long time is around gu guidelines, standardization, common information, um, all of those sorts of things. So if a new emerging issue comes up, we'll have a look at it and we'll do something on behalf of all the agencies so that they don't have to do it all themselves. Now, from the NAS report, we did a lot. Um, so one of the first things we did was establish a research and an innovation pathway. We had a look at all of the research that was being undertaken in Australia and New Zealand, um, and we looked at where was it focused, um, where was it not focused, um, what the issues were, who were the big leaders in research. We also looked at our law enforcement and judicial priorities and identified, well, what do our users of our, of our services actually need? What are their big issues that they need us to help with? We developed a research innovation strategy, a roadmap for where we thought everything needed to go in the next three years, and then annually we, we release a list of questions. So these are research questions that are operationally focused, and, the idea, and we feed these in through the academic institutions to help them inform honours projects, PhDs, masters, etc. So all of their research. And the labs can also use this for their research agenda. So there is a united vision on what are the operational requirements for research collectively across the country. That doesn't mean to say a lab won't have a specific issue that they'll want to develop, um, and that's completely uh, natural. So, but it's important to note there's two arms to this. Um, we've talked about the, the fundamentals. Um, the underpinning science, foundational validity, validity is applied, is really important. And we see this as a big arm of our research innovation pathway. And then the other arm is innovation. But even if you're looking at new capabilities and implementing new capa capabilities, you should also consider the foundational validity and validity is applied during that implementation process or that uh, innovation process. So we see both of these as two really important aspects uh, to our roadmap. So fundamentals is a big piece of work we've been doing uh, that John alluded to earlier. Um, the first thing we did is say, what do we mean? When we're talking about good quality forensic science, um, what, does it, what do we mean by that? Um, and this is what the NAS report was trying to uh, look at. We then released a document called um, uh, Forensic Fundamentals, Guideline 2. And then we used that to look at four disciplines. Um, we did a partial review of uh, bloodstain pattern analysis, shoe marks, document examination, and anthropology. Um, and it was really interesting because during that process, what we identified was that an understanding of an empirical study, what made a good empirical study, was somewhat lacking. 
We brought the leaders, best of the best of the disciplines, in to do these reviews, and we would spend half our time ignoring, um, arguing about what, whether a study, <laughs> ignoring, it's a Freudian slip, isn't it? Um, <laughs> ignoring them and telling them, no, um, arguing about what a good empirical study <laughs> was. Um, so we developed up a guideline for what a good empirical study looks like, and then we used that to review firearms, fingerprints, and explosives. We then adjusted it slightly based on their feedback and what worked, what didn't work, and then we release, released that final document earlier this year. We're now embarking on a review of toxicology, BPA, and gunshot residue. So a lot of this, uh, you've probably, I think, has been touched on a little bit in previous um, presentations. Um, so in terms of the, the forensic fundamentals, foundational validity being empirical studies, expertise, training, validity, limitations, and assumptions. And validity is applied being proficiency testing, accreditation, um, how you present your opinions, reporting scales, how you develop propositions, peer review, and human bias. So this is on the website as well. So it's just uh, what's covered in it. When we looked at understanding empirical studies, um, the, the aspects that they really needed advice on um, and we needed to really clarify were things like, how do you break a discipline down? So if you take fingerprints, it isn't just can you, um, you have a latent, can you match it to a, a 10 print and get the correct answer? Because there's, there's information and there's, there's ideas that underpin that, such as everybody has a different um, fingerprint, that your fingerprint persists over time. These are fundamental aspects that underpin um, those. So these are claims, um, what we call claims. So what we did is we broke the disciplines down into um, these claims and subclaims. And so we, we speak about that. What is a good design study? So how do you treat your variables, whether it's open, closed, blinding of participants and assessors, use of control, white box and black box design, which you all know what it is now, and replication. What do we mean by sufficient sample size? Um, the fact that you need ground truth, um, no material, and material that reflects casework. Um, that your results are appropriately described and reported. That your limitations are outlined, that you have appropriate conclusions, and it's critically reviewed and published. So a book, for instance, uh, we, don't, we didn't see that as necessarily supportive. You needed a, a peer-reviewed publication that uh, complied to these um, guidelines. So in terms of the process that we use for the fundamentals, uh, we have prioritised the disciplines, we break the discipline down into claims, and then we break those claims down into subclaims, and we review those subclaims against the literature using the empirical study guideline. We collate the literature, uh, we send that out to review with our stakeholders, and we identify any gaps and feed the gaps as research questions back into our roadmap. And we do this with a working group of leading experts. These, from, these are from government service providers and academia. So we're bringing those two arms together um, to have a look at this. Because the experts will know the technical components of it, but the academics really understand the research and what makes good research. And it's the combination of the two that really gives a good product in the end. So, just to give you an idea about how we do these claims, so this is fingerprints. So, as I said before, the claim is that fingerprints vary between people and that they persist over time. Um, that experts can enhance and detect and record impressions. They're claims. They underpin the, um, the comparison process. Uh, and so these are firearms ones. And as you can see, firearms have a lot more. It's more complicated. Uh, there's reconstruction, wound ballistics, all, all sorts of things like that. So it is a, a far more complex discipline, which I thought was, um, was reflective of, of what they do. Then when we identify, we break those down into identifying subclaims. You can look here on the left. Experts can match fired bullets to the weapon that fired them. So that's a claim, that they can do that. But it's based on the fact that different barrels have class and subclass characteristics that are persistent and reproducible. So it's based on that. It's also based on different barrels have individual characteristics that are persistent and reproducible, and you can go down through. So you break all of those claims in the previous slide into all of the subclaims. So that's quite a, a long process. And then you compare those against the literature. 
So here we have a claim, a subclaim, and then the literature that then supports it. So when you do this review, what you end up with is a catalogue of the data and the information that supports the discipline. So our practitioners can use this. This is a living document. It can be reviewed and added to so that when they go to court, they have the information if they're asked those questions. And you can break the entire discipline. So this is what we're, what we're doing and what is needed. And then you can assess from there and say, where can we build on the current um, body of knowledge? And you can identify things uh, that need to be done. And then you can convert those over into research questions, such as how do experts interpret and account for distortion during the analysis and comparison of fraction ridge skin? So if you give that to an academic, they can design a study using the empirical study guideline to answer that question, which then builds on the body of knowledge that you're trying to build on. Um, so this is the, the concept of, of the work that we're doing. And then all of that gets fed back into the roadmap and the annual questions each year. And what we've found is that there is a growing body of evidence about validity and reliability. And then there are some other evidence that indicates that um, some disciplines require more work. Um, and so this is a good thing. And a lot of this research is coming out of the US. And uh, there are a number of co-authors, uh, I think on five of the seven seminal papers, uh, that talk about that. So this is kind of where we are. So we have partial reviews of some of them in blue, uh, the green uh, completed, and the gray are yet to be done, as far as we can tell. Um, so this is the work that is before us um, and where we need to go. I thought I'd quickly me mention the standards, but I think they've kind of been addressed already in uh, previous talks, but there are two international standards published uh, and the process, that's all available online. So where do we go even moving forward? We have a lot of questions, right, um, that need to be addressed. What we actually need is a united pathway forward. And I'm not just talking about one country, because when you look at the questions and the work that needs to be done, there isn't one country that can address this. This is going to take a global collaborative effort. Um, and we need a global position on where are the gaps, what are the research questions, if we're actually going to address this underpinning science. It needs resources. It needs people, not just to conduct the research, but um, people to get on board that um, connection between the operational side of the house and the research side of the house needs to come together and be united um, to do this work. I think, I think we've seen quite a few examples of where it's working really well. And we need funding. Um, I don't know about you, but NIF smells, uh, runs on the smell of an oily rag uh, with our six people. So when I say this needs a global collaborative effort, I mean one that actually we can actually piecemeal this off, a united position, um, everyone takes a bit of it, and uh, there's some proper funding. Because um, I know in Australia, uh, you get research, government research dollars for innovative research that's developing new capabilities. You don't get it for doing a validation study. Um, and academics um, aren't always interested in doing that work. So we actually need to put money on the table to say we need this research question done and this one done, and then we'll get the academic buy-in to that. And I think that's what it's going to take. So. Uh, I'll conclude there and just say I have um, uh, a number of my team have helped me put this together and uh, done a lot of this work, so I want to thank them, plus all of our stakeholders in that big community collective that comes together to do the work uh, that we get done. So it's a, um, it's a big effort, um, but it's lots of people doing that. Uh, there's our website if you want any of those documents. Uh, they're all on there, um, and um, that's our Twitter handle which I will have to tweet today, otherwise my team will tell me off. So thank you very much. Hi, Chris Fabricant from the Innocence Project. Uh, thank you so much for your presentation, it was fascinating. I'm wondering, <clears throat> you identified a large uh, list of where the gaps in the literature were, and you've published them online. I'm wondering how that's affected 
admissibility decisions in Australia? Has the forensic science community gotten on board in recognizing that this is missing from the literature, or is there tension there? So um, all, of this, all of this information goes back to our laboratory directors. Um, who are then, who what they do is then conduct a review of their systems. Um, and so most of what we, what we found so far is actually we're in pretty much a good position. Um, and where, we're, where we need to build on the knowledge a little bit more, um, then the idea is that they go back and just check where their practitioners are providing evidence and, and opinions. And if they need to pull back, then they do so. Um, and then there are other areas where we find some gaps, but we know our practitioners aren't operating in that space, uh, such as activity level reporting for fingerprints. Um, so we just need to just ensure that that's the case, and that's how we essentially deal with it. So in other words, you haven't found any significant problems as a result of the lack of research and kind of like some of the basic, I think what you call them, uh, claims? Yeah, so one of our labs was doing a lot of hair analysis, and after that, after the FBI work, uh, they actually applied the same study and they pulled back all their hair analysis and no longer, well, when I say hair analysis, it's the comparison ID component of it. They'll stu still do the microscopic base and say it's human hair or suitable for DNA. Uh, so that still goes, but they don't do any actual comparison anymore. So they pulled back completely. They also did a review of all of their cases that had ever been done to see if it actually, if there were any issues that they had to go back for, uh, through as well. Um, and they didn't find any, uh, thankfully. But um, they did a complete review. So yes, they will go as far as they need to go. Any other questions? I have one. <laughs> um, we tried very hard to figure out a way to get the academic research community involved in forensic science. So I was wondering if you could talk to us about what efforts you've made to get the university involved. Um, what I didn't mention there is we set up a research and innovation advisory committee. And what we did is we brought together chief scientists from the forensic laboratories. So it isn't a rep from every lab, it's just who are the high performing laboratories in the country that have a dedicated re research facility and we brought those chief scientists in or heads of the research area. And then we looked around the country to say who are the major academic researchers, who are the um, academic institutions that have a a strong research, forensic science focused research body and we brought representatives from those areas in as well. So we get them around the table talking together um, and when we set our research um, annual questions it's as a collective. Um, and the good part about that is if there's some research that they say that can't be done or there's a problem with, we'll flesh that out at the table and we'll have that discussion. Um, and then what that also does is then it gets buy-in to the, to the questions so that when they take those questions back, they're the ones that they're going to use. And they know that they'll get support from the um, government service providers in order to help do the, uh, they can do the collaborative research then, uh, which they often find quite attractive. <laughs>